According to our tradition, the only righteous man left in the world, when he heard that the sea level was rising, built himself an ark, hoisted the gangplank, and to hell with everyone else. Hard to imagine that kind of attitude, isn't it? My name's Jason John, and with Jessica Moorthorpe, I job share the Uniting Earth position in New South Wales ACT. Here as I stand on Ark Australia today, we're going to reflect on the story of Noah's Ark and some of the other stories of salvation that we find in the scriptures. Who's included, who's excluded, and which story is it that we want to live out as Christians in this climate change world? So Noah, he was just a tad selfish, wasn't he? When he was warned that the sea levels were about to rise, he jumped in his ark, pulled up the gangplank, and sailed off, leaving everyone to suffer the consequences. As long as it was all right for him and his, he was happy. We don't talk about that much in the churches, but we have been confronted time and time again, or perhaps seduced, by the story of Ark Australia. Various Christian Prime Ministers on both sides of politics have been assuring us that all we need to do is settle down quietly so that they can keep us safe on Ark Australia, make anyone who needs help form orderly queues so that we can determine who will come on board the Ark and the manner in which they'll come on board. And as long as we don't rock the boat too much, we'll be allowed to stay here as well. Fortunately, that's not the only vision of salvation and abundant life which we find in the scriptures. And today I'm going to float three more of them with you to lead into some discussion about what it is that we want our future to be and who we want to be there. We'll be hearing about heaven, we'll be hearing about the heavenly Jerusalem descending, and we'll be hearing Jesus' story of the Samaritan, which offended just about everybody who heard it when he told it. So apart from Noah's Ark, the idea of it's, as long as it's good for me and mine, it's good, there's the Christian idea of heaven, that one day the sweet chariot will swing low and carry us away. And as long as we believe the right things and confess the right things, we'll get to go way up there somewhere, leaving everybody else behind to suffer the consequences. There's a couple of problems with that story, of course. One, it's not particularly no, biblical. Two, it's a bit difficult to know if you're going to get there. There are more Christian denominations than there are stars in the sky. And we believe different things. It's hard to know, particularly for someone like me who skates on the edge of orthodoxy at the best of times, whether I believe the right things to get me there. Even worse, having spent some time with Christians with really serious mental illnesses, it's apparent that um, one day when I visited them, they might be dedicated Christians singing songs of praise, the next day denying that God exists, and the next day saying that he was a complete bastard. So it depended which day they died, whether they'd get into heaven or not. A story of salvation which makes it that unpredictable whether we get there or not isn't a story that I want to invest a lot of time in. There's a secular version, of course, as well. Not so much flying up to heaven, but jumping in a spaceship and flying to colonise a new planet. But when I spoke to NASA, they said that people with my kind of physique and my kind of average intelligence and my very low budget aren't the kind of people they're looking for. So if humanity's salvation does lie in the stars, I'm not going to be part of it. And I'm pretty sure that none of you are as well. There's another version of salvation, not flying up to heaven, but the more biblical idea that God is going to come down here and fix everything for us. The heavenly Jerusalem in Revelation descends. It's gigantic. It's basically the size of the Roman Empire. It comes down. It replaces the Roman Empire. It crushes all of the oppressors. And it brings in a time of celebration for those who have suffered. All the nations will realize that the Jews, and of course particularly the Christian Jews, were right all along and worship God. And there'll be no more tears in our eyes. It's a beautiful story. Unless, of course, you're one of the oppressors. And, as a fairly affluent Australian, it can be difficult to know for sure that we're not. Who's making our clothes? Is it slaves overseas? Where does our coffee come from? What are we inflicting on future generations and the poor around the world at the moment by our levels of carbon consumption? Are we really sure that we're not the oppressors? The other, that story also has a secular equivalent, of course, not a city of gold descending, but gold itself. That if we just let the big corporations and mining companies get on with doing what they want to do, if we cut the green and the red tape, then they'll be able to save us. They'll come in, they'll give us jobs, they'll give us plenty of money, and we can use that money to save the environment. 
both of those versions of the story, of course, don't require us to do anything apart from just wait faithfully and get out of the way. It's a great deal. I'm happy to sit around and do nothing until God comes and rescues me, or a giant godlike corporation. The only problem with that story is that it doesn't seem to be true. Probably for Christians, the year 2000 was the last time that we could seriously say we thought Jesus was coming back any day now to fix things. God didn't come back. The heavenly Jerusalem didn't descend to save us from World War I or II, from Pol Pot, from the Holocaust, from the Crusades. So it seems the most reasonable bet to say that God's not coming to save us from climate change. We're going to have to do something about it ourselves. On the secular side, funnily enough, it seems that relying on profit-making corporations to save us and make the world a more equal and fair place doesn't work out too well. We've just passed the mark where 1% of the population controls more than half the wealth of the world. It'd be a great idea, it just doesn't seem to work. Fortunately, there's a fourth vision of salvation and sustainability into the future. The secular side, it's the kind of transition movement to a lower energy use pathway so that the rich use less energy so the poor can use more. I guess on the Christian side of things that would be called doing what Jesus said we should do. When I first became a Christian, the Sermon on the Mount was presented pretty much as a list of impossible demands simply orchestrated to make us feel bad so that we'd realise how hopeless things were, that we couldn't do anything about them ourselves and that we had to pray to God for forgiveness and rescue. But more recently when I read them it actually seems like maybe Jesus thought we would do what he said and live the way he told us to live. That everything he said about wealth and sharing and doing for our neighbour, he actually meant. Which brings us finally to the story that Jesus told that offended everyone, the story of the Good Samaritan. Now we say Good Samaritan, but of course Samaritans weren't good. Every Jew knew that Samaritans were despicable half-breed northerners who worshipped the wrong gods. When Jesus told the story about the man who's beaten up on the side of the road, about the priest and the Levite who come past and leave him, and then finally the Samaritan who rescues him, and particularly when he told that story to a Jewish leader asking who his neighbour was and what he needed to do to gain eternal life, Jesus was, in the most outrageous way possible, saying that if we want to know how to inherit eternal life, if we want to understand what it means to have a sustainable future, we need to be willing to learn from those that we most despise, the Samaritans in our life who we hate and who hate us, that probably don't want to see us there in the future and who we'd rather do without. Salvation into the future isn't a Noah salvation just for me and my family. It's not escaping either up to heaven or maybe to a town like Bellingham. It's not waiting for God or for a corporation to come along and rescue us. It's building a future together where we're all there or none of us are there. Because to be a child of God means to be like the God who sends rain on the just and the unjust, who is kind to the ungrateful. It means being merciful as God is merciful to all people. It means a future where we're all there or none of us are there. Now, maybe I'm being too hard on Noah. At least once he got on the ark, he just sat there and waited for things to unfold. But as you can see in the background from that coal ship, here in Australia, here in Ark Australia, we're actually still actively making things worse for the rest of the world. We're making it more likely that they're gonna drown. Not just through the coal that we export, of course, but through the coal that we burn here. We're the second highest emitter of carbon dioxide per head of population. So we're far worse than Noah. We're not just hiding here safely and trying to stop people getting on board, we're also making it more and more likely that they're gonna drown.